Um, but yeah, um, just to introduce our uh, our distinguished speaker tonight, uh, um, Modibo Kadali has been an activist and organizer in the civil rights, black power, and pan-Africanist movements uh, for now 60 years, having gotten his start in the Atlanta lunch counter sit-ins of 1960. In the 1970s, he was involved with a variety of radical organizations uh, like the League of Revolutionary Black Workers and the African Liberation Support Committee in Detroit and Atlanta. Um, in 2017, he founded the Autonomous Research Institute for Direct Democracy and Social Ecology in Midway, Georgia. Um, we're both on the, the uh, council of, of that organization. His new book, uh, which we mentioned a couple of times already, uh, Pan-African Social Ecology, Speeches, Conversations, and Essays, examines past and present movements through the lens of uh, direct democracy and social ecology, and suggests new optics for understanding social motion uh, that reject the hierarchical and nationalist models of the old left and recenters the horizontal self-organization of everyday people in their communities as they struggle for freedom. And of course, the other book that we're um, promoting today is uh, Deciding for Ourselves, which is an anthology um, uh, put together by our friend Cindy Milstein, um, and this book is really remarkable. It uh, documents, um, it co it's a collection of writings from people kind of on the ground, but documenting the kind of directly democratic movements and experiments in uh, self-governance um, from across the globe. Uh, so there's uh, examples in here, a couple examples from Mexico, uh, from Denmark, Greece, um, and uh, Kurdistan. And so, so some of these examples y'all might be familiar with, some maybe less so. And I really encourage y'all to pick up uh, uh, both or either of these books, um, either from Firestorm or from uh, uabooks.org or akpress.org. Uh, they all carry uh, these books, but definitely uh, see, check, it, check out, see if Firestorm can help you out first. Um, before you go looking anywhere else. Um, so uh, with that, Mick already explained some of the format for, its, uh, for tonight. You know, we're gonna, Modibo and I are gonna talk a little bit and present a little bit and then uh, kind of converse. And then we'll soon open it up to a more open conversation where we are reading your thoughts and your questions. And, uh, and then, uh, We'll see where the, where that takes us. Um, just to kick it off, uh, Modibo asked me to let's see to prompt him with a question, which we uh, it's a little spontaneous. We have we haven't really rehearsed this, so um, but I. Um, good format. Good format. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Modibo, I'm going to. Uh, start you off with this question I put together uh, earlier today, which was, I think, something that's on all of our minds. Um, the recent pandemic has been called unprecedented moment in history. And in many ways, that might be true. However, I'm curious if you see any historical parallels to the present moment based on your own experiences. Moreover, I'm curious what lessons from your lifetime with direct action and mutual aid might be applied during the coronavirus pandemic? Are there specific stories from your lifetime as an organizer and agitator that you might see as relevant to popular self-organization right now? Yeah, okay, that, that's an involved question, but we did stumble on this format and it, uh, it's a good format, but it, it, it's back and forth, back and forth. And that's where, I, that's where I've learned my most uh, my, my most real sharp kind of conceptualizations from this kind of discussion. And I hope that uh, all of y'all are welcome and I hope that y'all get into it too, you know, fuss a little bit and tell, you know, just be, get down with it, you know what I mean? But this, this pandemic is, is something that we all uh, involved in here, but, but I think we need to say something generally about it before we go any further. Human beings, 
have have you know have have bodies. Other organisms have bodies, and since the industrial revolution, the life support system of every living thing on the planet has been uh, has been uh, really degraded. And so what we see is uh, this new pandemic is a situation where the scientists are trying to put a cap on something that they're not going to be able to control except in the short run. In the long run, they're going to have to deal with the fact that human beings and other living things on this planet, we all have to live together in a symbiotic relationship in the long run. Now what the scientists do, and this is what makes it so bad, the scientists come up with a paradigm that we're going to have a wall on this virus. And we're going to have a wall on this and a wall on that. And what they do is simply try to control it, like it's some kind of invading uh, species. You can see it in Hollywood, you know, with these horror movies with the invading uh, various kinds of crazy shit that comes from the from the from out of space and they invade your body and they invade your, you know, they, they just fuck your shit up, you know what I mean? But that's not what's, that's really not what's happening. What is happening is that a new paradigm has to be developed where people, scientists even, have to understand that uh, the human body and the other bodies and other living things are trying desperately to deal with all this pollution and all this, uh, uh, environmental degradation has happened, especially accelerated over the past couple of hundred years with the Industrial Revolution. Now, <laughs> if you look at all the diseases, and I, you know, when I was coming up, uh, kids were suffering with infantile paralysis called polio. And I had lost a couple of aunts before I even was born to typhoid. Uh, Native Americans suffered from uh, uh, smallpox and all kinds of other things. I myself had asthma, and I mean, I, I understand what it means to be desperately gasping for air, trying to breathe in a situation where the, where, where the uh, air is not breathable. So what, what, what is happening now is this virus is um, vilified, and they want to have a war on it, and, and, and we have to be careful because uh, the people who run these nation states and these big corporations, they think that science has made such an, a, a, a great leap forward in this last 200 years. Yeah, it has done that. There's been all kinds of scientific and technological advances. But in what direction did it, did it go? I mean, you know, it went into a situation where people are, are buying and selling things. These people are not really interested in controlling this disease, this, 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 uh, well, they're interested in controlling it, but they're interested in making money. And that's why the research is sponsored by these big corporations, supported by government grants. And they are, they're going to uh, get it just so that people can go back to work and get sicker and sicker and sicker. There are going to be more and more viruses coming into play. The state is going to use that, or try to use that, to uh, clamp down on people's freedoms and people's uh, rights, and people, the people are going to respond. And uh, science has to be understood as having a certain direction. If the science is designed to make money, and computer programs are designed to make money, these guys like Bill Gates and all these guys, to me, they're just creeps. They're not, they're not no big geniuses or nothing like that. They're just creeps. That's all. They're just, they're just figuring out a way to make more money using these little machines and shit. And, uh, and I, 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 I mean, I, I've been to school, you know, I see what they're saying. But science has to be reoriented in a direction where human beings learn to live in a symbiotic situation with the rest of the natural world. They have to do that. So I, I just want to answer that directly. Now, what we have to do is what we're doing here now. It's really great to see y'all on my screen. Uh, y'all are some nice looking people, you know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, we are able to communicate in this way and share knowledge using, and I'm sure that these people didn't design for it to be used this way, but they, 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 uh, we have to use the technology that's available to us.
just like the Vietnamese had to use the technology that's available to them. But the point is, we have to uh, understand that uh, direct democracy, and this is a, a form of direct democracy, is everywhere. And the human impulse for direct democracy is a driving force. Uh, representative democracy and big states and big government, big centralized authority, all that shit is really inhuman. And, and if you look at the arc of history, you find that it, it hadn't been around that long. Human beings have been human beings interacting for over 200,000 years. The only stuff that's documented is the states, you know, and the hierarchical societies. And that's not what human beings are and have been. Human beings work together. That's a, that's a kind of a natural tendency. I mean, if they weren't working together, we wouldn't be here two, for 200,000 years. The natural instinct of human beings are to cooperate and to work together, not the competitive, avaricious uh, stuff that you see on the NFL or, or whatever they create to compete, to, to pit people against one another. And we have to fight that kind of stuff. You know, we have to, we have to not just get along, we have to love one another. And a, a new kind of science has to emerge. And, uh, you know, we, we, we'll, we'll do what we can to awaken everybody to understand that little, that little bit of it. That's a big question. <laughs> you started with a big old ass question here. <laughs> <laughs> I like to hear what other people have to say. But, uh, Modibo, I was curious, though, like, on the question of, you know, in previous talks and in our conversations, we have talked a lot about mutual aid and forms of democracy that emerge in times of crisis and how these things seem to kind of organically emerge. And um, I know one example uh, you've shared before has been in the Detroit Rebellion uh, in, is that 67 or 68? Uh, 67. 67. It was again in 68, Martin Luther King was assassinated in 68, but the yeah. first one was in 67. Would you, would you mind uh, sharing for folks uh, your remembrances of, of the 67 rebellion and the, the networks of, of mutual aid that uh, emerged there? Oh, yeah. You can see it. You can see it in, in, uh, in, the, in uh, New Orleans, too. And you can see oh, it down, yeah. down in Brunswick, Georgia. You can see it everywhere. But, mm -hmm. but we're, not, we're not trained to see it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So in my situation, I was in Canada, and uh, I was, uh, you know, the war was going on. And I was a drafted beta. And I really tried to get back in, but they had closed off the border. And I couldn't get back in until the, uh, the rebellion subsided. So they opened up the, uh, the bridge in the tunnel. And I had a cousin that lived off 12th Street. 12th Street is now um, Rosa Parks Boulevard. He lived on Sturdivant Street, for those who know uh, Detroit. <clears throat> and uh, there was a Safeway. Safeway was like the Kroger of the time. There was a Safeway on the corner there. And my, my cousin said to me, so I said, what happened, Sam? He said, man, the niggas went crazy right here, man. They were stealing shit and, and, and doing, I said, were they stealing? They said, yeah, they took, the, they took all the food out of the Kroger. I said, what are they doing with it? Well, uh, they were giving it to these uh, old ladies down on the other end of the block. I said, well, well that's not, that don't seem like stealing to me. And he said, I said, did they, who, who are these guys that did that? He said, they're these same little old boys, you know, they push the carts around. They, they. I said, well, how long did it take them to, to take the food out of the uh, store? And man, they, they, they looted that store within two hours. I said, you kidding me? They organized themselves in such a way that they could take the food out of the store and give it to them ladies in two hours? He said, yeah, man, they did that, man. They were working like, they were working hard. <laughs> so, uh, so I said, Sam. Did they give you anything? <laughs> he said, yeah, what kind of steaks you want? <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, Sam looked at it stealing, and they gave them, boy, the boys gave the good stuff to the ladies down the street. They didn't give Sam nothing but what was left. But they organized themselves to do that. You know what I mean? It's self-organized. No, no uh, tie, no Negro with a briefcase came down and told them they need to be organized, and they did that. Uh, you saw it in, in, uh, in Katrina, but I want to bring another one to your attention. Y'all know about it. You know about the young man that got killed down in Brunswick down there. Where, where I am, I'm, I'm down in uh, Midway, Georgia, just south of Savannah. That's where I am now. 
the young man named Ahmad. Um, they tried to kill him. Now, well, they killed him and then tried to sweep it under the, the table. Now, Ahmad had some friends, and they never did believe, and of course the mother, they never did believe the police story of it all. They never did. They never went for it. And they closed, the, the policeman closed the case, the public defense, I mean, not the public defense, the district attorney uh, who said it was an open and shut case. And so those young men and young women went out to that community where the boy was killed and walked up and down the street and ran up and down the street and said, we are running with Omar. This young man was, a, was an avid job. So they were running up and down the street. And then that same night, the, the, um, the, the video dropped. Now, you see, <laughs> that's why you have to be careful. If you, if you look at the way they say it, it looks like that these people came forward with the video and then the demonstration took place. No, the demonstration took place first. There was no uh, black leader there, no black Negro with a, with, a, with a briefcase or a suit or a Bible or none of that. They didn't lay kneel down and pray and all that kind of stuff. They just went there and said, we pissed off, we run with Omar. So they started running through the community and start being Ahmad in mass is what they did. And that's when the guy, that's when the guy who had uh, taken the picture, he then trying to keep himself out of it uh, to make sure that he was not right there on the scene, he published the video. And when the video dropped, all of us, it, it went on, it went, it, went, it went viral. But the point is that it is his friends that self-organize that thing. And that's the way history has to be written, because that's the way it is. Martin Luther King didn't organize the Montgomery bus boycott. Rosa Parks didn't either. It was the people of, of Montgomery who organized themselves and got themselves to work on time for a year. If Martin Luther King had not have been born, if he didn't come to town with his big Buick, if he wasn't in the church, in the church as a preacher, it still would have. So I, what I'm trying to say is that we have to train ourselves to observe these kinds of things as the events take place right in front of our eyes. And the first thing we got to do is take all these individual initiatives out of it. Individual initiatives are secondary to it. The second thing is that state policy is always epiphenomenal. State policy is a response to mass motion. It, is not, it doesn't create mass motion. And so, uh, you know, that, that's kind of the way we have to begin to understand this process so that we can take up the, uh, the task of rewriting history from the perspective of everyday ordinary people in, in, in human action. That's why we, we, we got to realize first two, you know, this is the fundamental thing, 200,000 years of competition, we would, have, we would not have even been here as human beings. Human beings operated two and a half, two and a half thousand years of cooperation, and there was no states involved. States emerged, uh, and they, all of the history of the states are recorded, and they are, called, they're, they're, they are called cultures and civilization and all that shit. But, but, but the collective organization of people, large groups of people. Uh, that's not that's that that's 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 really one fraction of the history that's written, but it's the great majority of the history that, that took place. I'm yep. talking. I'm talking. No, no, it's good. No, that's good. I mean, that's a, that's a point that I think a lot of people like when when we talk about direct democracy and we talk about you know. Um, vision of, of popular self-governance and that really excludes the state. People always assume the state as being this like eternal thing that's always been with us and that we're talking about some kind of like radical shift away from what they believe human nature is. And I think that uh, it's important to distinguish that for the majority of human history. Uh, yeah, that's the majority vast, vast majority <laughs> the states have, have not been around. I'm sure, I'm sure that will bring up some more questions uh, for some folks, but it's, uh, and then people say, oh, well, you know, 
that was a long time ago. It's a different way of life, and and we didn't didn't have X, Y, and Z, and this, and uh, but and so you know these, you know, direct democracy might not be possible now because of these different factors. But I think that's why Cindy's book, uh, Deciding for Ourselves, has been so important uh, because it really shows the continuing drive that people have to govern their own lives and uh, and get out from under the heel of all sorts of various oppressive uh, hierarchies that, that we're kind of forced to deal with on a daily basis. Um, and they, think, they think states are required organization. If people working together and create things themselves and collectively in motion, they're unorganized. You, know, you remember we were talking uh, some time ago, and you were talking about what was happening in the dark ages in Europe. You know what I was yeah. saying? Oh, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> in the dark ages, that shit was happening. That was unsure. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that, that, but that was where Europe, human Europe, was was really taking the, taking place. And the, and the dark yeah. continent, you know, nothing happened over there. But the point is, human beings. I mean. <laughs> Human beings have learned to cooperate and work together and create institutions. Mm. But but the, our problem is that the scholarship and the activism right. is not documenting that. They don't know how to do it because they train to do otherwise, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's like you said, the uh, it, it is about a way of seeing and 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 we're we're quite trained to look at history through a very kind of top-down hierarchical lens. I mean the example of the the so-called dark ages is yeah. my favorites because i mean <laughs> people you know people in the so-called dark ages you had you know autonomy autonomous cities throughout europe and where people were practicing all sorts of uh interesting experiment not even experiments these were long-standing institutions yeah. of democracy where people you know, could collectively in their communities decide what needed to get done and how to do it and implement it. Um, and, and throughout these uh, medieval communes, this was just how shit was done. And, um, and um, even among the peasantry at the time, you had a, a very good quality of life compared to a lot of what came after. And, uh, you know, then you have the Renaissance, which is, and the and the the so-called Enlightenment, which is portrayed as like this great kind of awakening, beautiful moment, but which is defined and instigated by some of the most massive state violence that we've ever heard of. You know, uh, in particular, the, um, the witch hunts, where which was this massive uh, 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 state violence against. Um, uh, peasant women who were practicing medicine. By the way, in the so-called dark ages, medicine for the majority of people was a part of the community and it was free. And, and you know, this, this, it was largely pe peasant women who were, you know, basically not only developing medical science, but, uh, but recording it and passing it down. And it took a massive state, violent state intervention to uh, destroy that tradition in Europe. And that was the beginning of the so-called Renaissance and the so-called Enlightenment and, and, and all this kind of stuff. So it really shows you how twisted one's uh, twisted. And, th and then the thing that bothers me so much is they, they look at that as being unscientific. I mean, when, when right. people, <laughs> that, and then you're, you're against technology when people have learned <laughs> to, to create stuff and do, do things for themselves. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's amazing. And, and, and then we must really write the history of the Industrial Revolution. That's a very violent process. It's a very ugly process. Of the, 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 I mean, to Henry Ford and all them people, man, no, they were not heroes. They were, they were villains. They were poisoning the atmosphere and putting people to work on assembly lines and breaking their backs and breaking their health. And these people are not geniuses. They're not nothing. They can kiss my ass, tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh... I, on, on related to um, Ahmad Arbery's murder, I was wondering um, since one one aspect of this whole thing that rarely gets talked about is the context of this being a, a Gullah Geechee community. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that, that's, um, important. that's important. I, I think it is important. 
And I think that, you know, may, perhaps there might be some people on the call who might not be familiar with the, the historical context there. And I was, I was wondering if you could tell some folks briefly about, uh, just give a basic rundown of Gullah Geechee history and, and, and why, what distinguishes that culture. Um, and and it's, not, it's not anything unique. Like any time there's spontaneous social motion, people mm -hmm. move forward, but in order to, because what, what is critical about the social motion is, is that it's really not spontaneous, but what is critical about it is that it, uh, it breaks down the legitimacy of the state. The state has no authority, no legitimacy of nothing. The policemen come there and people will look up the barrel of a policeman's gun and throw it away. And they don't, you don't give a fuck about no policeman. That's a part of spontaneous upheaval. But in the process, they always reach back to their collective mm -hmm. uh, uh, culture some kind of way. And uh, this, this boy, Ahmad, is in Brunswick. And his grandfather uh, was raised on an island off the coast of McIntosh County. Mm, which island? Uh, uh, Sapelo. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. His grandfather was. Most, like most of the people were. What, what is now modern uh, urban Brunswick and Savannah, these people were, uh, at the, at the, when the Civil War was over, they were uh, farmers and they were people who were uh, organizing themselves to feed themselves. You know, that's who they were. Yeah. And uh, they had they had these this strong bonded uh, strong culture and, and, and really try, they tried to de degradate the culture. I remember when I was coming up, people used to try to say that these Negroes down here, and then the Geechee. Well, I mean, you know the Geechee. The Geechee is a, a stereotype. You see it in Hollywood movies. Geechee Dan, and he's some wild crazy guy who. Uh, <laughs> Who is just mad and evil and undirected and undisciplined. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the type of the Geechee. But the Geechee is, a, is, is, is the culture of the people who were raised on these cottonies or rice plantations down here and who had some autonomy. And then when the white people abandoned the plantations and they came back and tried to take them, they wouldn't let them go, so they maintain control over land. And you have, if you came, if you come down here in the 1940s, you see black communities all over the place, independent. Sometimes people don't even see no white people, <laughs> you know, for years. And uh, you know, and so this young man came out of that tradition. And so he, people, really, all it when the policemen tried to say what they said about him, nobody believed him anyway. Mm. Nobody, nobody. They had no uh, legitimacy or authority at all. And so when those people went over there to this community, by the way, this community that he was jogging through was a community called Satilla Shores, which was a, a white community, predominantly white community. But it was across the road, across 17 or 17 from a, a black community. So he just crossed over and he was running through the, through the area. But these people were people who came from the north, and some of them came from the other place. They were, you know, they were uh, they were a particular type of racist that were part of the United States and North America. But this this this, uh, this Gullah Geechee thing down here is really strong, and it uh, it uh, it has a collectivity and it speaks to a certain amount of cooperation that everybody mm -hmm. knows about. You know, and they, it's. Uh, I grew up with it, so my, you know my parents came down here. I mean, when they came down here, they were young people. They just got married. I wasn't even born, so my 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 siblings and I were born down here. So we grew up in Beaches, you know. and it's been very helpful. To keep me you know, keep, keep me out of a lot of shit, really, because <laughs> I know some of that stuff I don't even read. <laughs> wait, 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 who was keeping you out of what shit? The culture. Okay, okay. The culture. See. I never, I never was susceptible to the fact that black people were ignorant and dumb and never mm. had that. Because when I grew up, they had something. And they were not, ignorant. they were not dumb. And to the extent, and they actually voted. They couldn't run for office, but that, that part of that struggle from the Reconstruction period, they could vote. And I didn't know what all that. Was. My brother and father voted. All the people I knew voted up and down the coast. They could vote. But it was, uh, it was. Uh, a situation where during the Civil War, these people took the plantations that belonged to the white people, 
made it their own. I think and that, then of course, the white people got to take it back. Right. But you have to read that history, you know, to figure it out yourself. Yeah. So when, um, you see, when you see a geisha, when you see a geisha now, y'all, y'all supposed to be respectful. <laughs> When uh, I think that 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 kind of fits nicely into what another question I was going to ask you, which was about this concept of intimate direct democracy that you first introduce in this book, um, and the kind of intimacy that uh, that maybe would you say the kind of intimacy that you experienced on the community level, like growing up in Geechee Land, uh, influenced influenced you in this way like towards a directly democratic politics or yeah, yeah, yeah. it related like, you, like when we were talking earlier before we went on and i was asking mike where you know why did you come to Ashley? and he explained it perfectly he basically yeah. said that you want to be a part of a community where everybody kind of knew one another and if some shit happened they wouldn't believe it because mm -hmm. they knew he would he wouldn't do that you know what i mean and, mm -hmm. and I, I, I don't, I don't want to get dive in that we had a perfect kind of society. What happened was, I mean, you knew who the thieves were, so you hide your shit from <laughs> the around. You know, and you know, you know, you know who the, who the people who lying, you just didn't believe them. Nobody believed you. They, they'll listen, but they didn't believe it. But this young man had a, a community backing and a strong support system that uh, the, 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 the lies of the cops and the district attorney could not overcome. You know, it looked like they don't, you know, they don't have to do more, and they, they, you will see how it unfolds. Absolutely. Um, another uh, another thing going on, some folks might be familiar with, is that in uh, New Orleans, the currently the sanitation workers are striking, and hospitality workers have gone on a sympathy strike. Uh, last I heard. Um, uh, you have experience with another sanitation workers strike in 1977. Um, so I'm wondering if you, first off, if you have some thoughts on the uh, New Orleans sanitation workers strike, and then I wouldn't mind if you, if you're, if you would mind uh, uh, sharing some uh, reflections on the 77 sanitation workers strike. Yeah, it's, um, there's a tendency among African American people to, after, after the Civil Rights Movement, to be uh, susceptible to identity politics and extreme forms of symbolic uh, power. And you see that in, in, in the supreme example of the popularity of the, the last president of the United States, uh, Barack Obama. I mean, he could do, he could get away with a lot of stuff, you know what I mean? But just because he wore a suit and he was articulate and white and looked good and loved his dog, you know. But then Hitler loved his dog, you know. But, but the point I'm getting at here Maynard Jackson, the first black mayor, was elected mayor of the city of Atlanta in 1974. The garbage workers of that time supported him. Uh, the second election, he was elected again, and he fired the guys. The garbage workers went on strike with the expectation that Maynard Jackson would uh, honor the promises that he made in, in gathering their support, and uh, he, he did. You know, and, and, and the petty bourgeoisie was in turn. And people, people really know now that black elected officials, at least they learned that. Black elected officials, now by the way, the mayor of uh, New Orleans is a black woman. Black elected officials and the black, you know, some people call it the black official class or the black uh, political class. I, I, don't, I don't call them that, I just call them the petty police receipt. <clears throat> These people uh, supported Maynard Jackson in firing the garbage workers and uh, made them reapply for the jobs that they, 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 they formerly worked for. They were just asking for a wage increase and they were asking for some respect. And what happened was in the city of Atlanta, the workers were isolated. The people were believing what 
Oh, the Maynard Jackson was saying, and then the media was asking Maynard Jackson, what is the position of the garbage workers, which, is, which was absurd. And uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's father, Daddy King, he said, fire the hell out of it. And people couldn't believe that. They, they figured that these people were just turned, you know, and they're just making a mistake and all. So what we did in order to just bring some attention to it, because the workers were being isolated every day through the media and through Maynard Jackson's and the city administration. So Maynard Jackson, garbage was piling up in the street. So uh, we decided that we had better do something dramatic, do some kind of direct action, very dramatic action. So what we did was basically collected garbage. We had about two or three vans. I was driving one of my, my big old van. And we collected garbage from the street because Maynard Jackson had said, bring your garbage to a central location and we will pick it up for you. So what we did is took the garbage to the city hall. We dumped a couple of, about, about three tons of garbage on the city hall, which was the central location. So, you know, we, and so you have to intervene like that sometimes. Now in this situation down, in this, situ <laughs> in this situation down, 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 in, uh, down in, uh, in New Orleans, you know, Andrew, they, um, they, re they fired the workers and they replaced them with, uh, with prison labor. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now that, that, that uh, and it's a black woman. And so, so this, this particular company, since they privatized the collection, see, it, those city workers went to the city of Atlanta when we were supporting the garbage workers. But what she says is that we, I can't do anything. I've got a contract with this garbage collection people and I don't want to do anything. I'm saving the city some money because we've got this contract with these people. And uh, I, I just hope that people see through that and uh, understand that uh, whether the, the state is run by black or white bureaucrats, whether it's run by uh, Chinese, uh, whatever bureaucratic, once you have a capitalist state apparatus, a state apparatus in your way, it don't matter what color it is, don't matter what gender it is. It's, uh, you can't, it's not a question of electing the right people. The right people will not do it for you. I, I, I want to see some of these people. These people are looking, they, I know how to be in an audience and, and not have nothing to say. So, so I, I'd like to hear what they got to say. I mean, come on, let's, let's get some questions. Yeah, if, um, if anybody wants to, you know, put forward uh, some questions, just jump, dump them right there in the chat. Um, if you haven't used Zoom before, if you go to the bottom of the screen, there's an icon that says chat with a little word bubble next to it. And that should bring up the chat window to your right. And you can type some questions there and I'll make some comments. comments or comments or, or uh, what have you. Um, while we're waiting on that, uh, well, Debo, I'll just ask you one other quick thing. Now, the other bit of sad news that emerged from uh, Georgia recently was the passing of uh, the architect of rock and roll, Little Richard. <laughs> uh, you and I, we, the two of us, we often talk about music. Well, we. A lot about music, but um, I was wondering if you might share with the the group uh, some of your reflections on Little Richard, because I never lived in a time before Little Richard, you know. And I, I don't know. I, I would, I'd like, I, I think it'd be cool to share like what I don't know. Well, well what, what I would urge you, to, I would, what I would urge all of us to do is to make sure that we take care of ourselves so that we can become the history of historians that we can be just by living a long life. I'm, I'm 78 now. I, I can jump up and I can jump up on this, on this desk right here. I need to lose a few pounds. But I used to play that music, Little Richard stuff. You know, I, I know Boney Maroney and Long Tall Sally. But, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but the point about this is when Little Richard busted on the scene, Macon, Georgia is a, uh, it's in the middle of Georgia. But it's, a, it, it's really, those people are my mother and father's people. They're not, they're not Geechees, but they came out of the sharecropping cotton field and they accumulated in Macon. And so Little Richard was uh, the son of a preacher and he could play the piano. He was a trained piano person. And because the, uh, 
warriors of the time was that uh, you know you you, you, didn't, you you stayed out of you, you made sure that if you were gay you can kind of stay and put one foot in the closet and one foot out so little richard was the pianist of the church and and the music the musician of my group played the same way that little richard did that's the kind of music we play okay now this was an authentic organic music it uh it um it it, it was a, a music that became known to me at least as rhythm and blues now blues came directly off the farm because it was an agonizing kind of music it came directly from the mississippi delta and out of the cotton field but when it got to the city and it, it was more upbeat it had a rhythm to it now since the south was segregated and really if you look at it in central georgia and really the central central georgia and central alabama and central mississippi they're, they're really the same places they, they uh they had they were based on a cotton economy they were segregated they were a lot of lynching going on a lot of segregation going on and 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 what what people would do what little richard and james brown and well, well, that's before the white guys got it. <laughs> they used to travel and play, you know, to rural audiences, to uh, juke joints. And so a, 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 a black working class cultural set of network of centers, cultural centers emerged. And they, they were called, and they were organized, self-organized. They were called juke joints. The white working class out in uh, Texas and those places, they organized something similar. They call them honky tonks. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But the point is, this music was on parallel courses. Mm. You know? And um, when Little Richard went to Europe, the Beatles and Rolling Stone and all those people, they, 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 they knew of Little Richard. But they, their music was really imitation of Little Richard. So I, I, I would argue with Andrew. I, I, I said this, this whole rock and roll thing is not authentic. That's a bastardization of rhythm and blues, and it was a copyrighting of, of black music. Uh, you know, we argued about it back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> but Little Richard called it rock and roll. He did. He does. He did call it rock and roll. He said he's the architect of rock and roll. <laughs> but this music was uh, giving cultural. Uh, momentum to, to a movement of people that were becoming urbanized. And then when uh, the, the, the bastardization took place with this rock and roll and the Beatles and everybody and the white people started getting into it, they went back in the church and they emerged again as soul. <laughs> so they had two companies. They had two companies. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but, but the point is that this music and the culture always speaks to um, what, what the people really are. And even like the, the reggae stuff out of Jamaica, that's some, that was some organic cultural stuff. It wasn't, it wasn't a, an attempt to, uh, to to imitate white music or anything. It was, it was, it came from what they call the roots. So there's an authenticity, and and, and even the style of it. You know what I mean? Everybody had a say in it. The guitar player had a say. The drummer had a say. And the vocalist had a say. And, Little Richard would jump up on top of the piano, <laughs> you know, he had a say, you know. And then when jazz came about, jazz is more, more secular, but it, it doesn't have any, it's, it's instrumental music. I call that like classical instrumental music. Uh, but it, it's, it's very directly democratic. It's all directly democratic. Every, everybody talks to everybody in there. You know? mm. So the music, I mean, you can, the musical structure, in the case direct and even the folk music the folk music was uh of all of the people whether it's Irish, Scottish, Zulu or whatever it was a collectivity of people uh celebrating what they needed to celebrate to bring their their culture together it's a cultural cohesive kind of thing and stuff is quite beautiful too really and sometimes you wonder why it gets to you that's because you're human <laughs> that's why it gets to you you're human that's why <laughs> I want to see what uh, 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 Alfonso Williams got to say. You're writing something down, Alfonso. I see it. Yeah, let me, I, I can uh, unmute Alfonso. Alfonso, unmute, you want to ask your unmute, question? Unmute. Yeah, just a second. Uh, well, all right, 
You're on mute, Alfonso. You can go ahead. Gotcha. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, uh, your thoughts on in a, in a situation like right now with COVID going on <clears throat> and uh, the onus of responsibility being passed around to different people. In general, if we had to generalize, who is more um, responsible for uh, keeping things in general order, so general housekeeping? So would that responsibility fall more on uh, the government side because they have more access to certain resources because they're an institution? Or um, does that fall more on the constituent side um, which contains all the different particularities um, and all the different, uh, I guess, secular resources that the government may not have access to because it's too big. Well, Alfonso. Yes. We all think in terms of the big central government taking care of us. And even the Black Power movement, they always want the government, they think, want the government to live up to the true meaning of its creed and its responsibility. The central government ain't gonna do shit. It ain't gonna do nothing. What's gonna happen is the people at the local level will have to figure out ways at their local health departments and everything, how to test people, and, you know, they can do some stuff, but they're gonna have to organize that themselves. Like in Riceboro and Midway, the, the citizens have organized these uh, testing sites. Uh, the health department, and call the health department to come in. Now, the central government didn't have nothing to do with that. Gotcha. That's why I don't even look for the central government doing anything, but make wars. They make wars and spend a lot of money and cause a lot of shit, but uh, they don't solve, they don't probably solve it. Like, like in Montgomery, Alabama, the, 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 the people, People took matters into their own hands, like down in um, down in Brunswick. Uh, the kids took that took that into their own hands, and that's how you have, that's how you have to do it. And then when people take the initiative and you think it's good and local, you go out there and help them out. You know what I mean? But I've seen a lot of stuff. I've seen people feed all of the elderly people. I'm elderly, but nobody seems to want to come and bring me no food. <laughs> <laughs> But there are some people who go to elderly people's houses and take them food. Matter of fact, I would go if I had the time, but they seem like it's covered my system and they all do that. Somebody shut in. And, uh, but 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 you, you're gonna have to be responsible for yourself, the way you eat, the way you take care of yourself, the way you get some rest, and uh, you know, all that smoking and drinking and staying out all night. Uh, guys my age, uh, they can't walk. That those are the guys that did that, they can't hardly walk. You know, <laughs> but but uh, we, we can't look for this. When you talk about even the old Marxists, you know, they talk about seizing state power and, and running the government. Well, if they seize state power and run the government, you better look out. <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be some shit then. So what 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 uh, you have to look for and how you become active. Do what you need to do at the local level and work with people and try to dismantle this thing over the long run. Now, this virus is going to do a lot to discredit it now. People are now seeing, of course, they're blaming it on Trump. But, but look at all the nation states all over the world. None of them handled this shit. None of them did. I mean, can you imagine 100,000 100, people dying in America? You know, it's, 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 it's approaching that. In Italy and all of Big, great civilization, the big, great civilization, they, they're big science and all that shit. They're the ones that caused it, and they can't do nothing about it, so they're trying to profit off of it. So we have to be careful. We can't believe, I mean, we can't get scared like those kids down there. They did do something. They took a risk. They had the little mask on, but they had to come out and, and watch you that community. They had to do it. So I, I, I wish them the best. I'm not going to put out that right now until I understand it a little bit. I, I Alfonso, do my, yeah. sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, Go ahead. did you want to follow up at all, Alfonso? Oh, no, that was excellent. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Madiba, I was wondering if kind of going off of that um, in your entry and deciding for ourselves, I thought it was really great uh, because you talked about different forms of democracy. 
Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk about the distinctions between representative democracy, participatory democracy, and direct democracy, and why it is that you advocate and support for direct democracy and not the other two, the other two forms. Okay, and participatory democracy is uh, sometimes uh, masquerading as uh, direct democracy. Direct democracy is not when the, the, the people have decided to group together and, and ask the government to do something. You know I mean? And the government say, well, we're going to get you a seat at the table and we'll listen to your voices. No. Direct democracy is when the people govern. They make the decision and carry the shit out. They do the whole shebang. Now, it's hard, but we, have, we got a long way to go to get there. Now, representative democracy is a big sham. <clears throat> let me let me let me just say this: um, the, the American government has never been democracy, been a democracy in any way. And they, when they when they when they ma masqueraded around like they're some kind of big great democracy, anytime you vote for somebody, and then they go somewhere else to make a decision for you, that means you don't have no vote. You voted for them, they took it and they stole it. They stole it in the electoral process. Now, let's look at it on its face. It's on its face. In the United States of North America, there are roughly, you know, give or take 10, 10 million, about 350 million people now, citizens. In, the, in Washington, the people who make laws, what about 329? Now, if you subtract the uh, representatives from Washington, the Virgin Islands, and Guam, who don't vote, it's about 335, 336, something They are supposed to make the laws for all of these people. I mean, come on now. And then when you look at it, <laughs> when you look at it, California, New York, Florida, and Texas, their, pop their combined population make up one-third of the whole shebang. But in the Senate, which makes the appointments and everything, and, and does the international treaties and all, they, they have the same amount of representation as Wyoming, North Dakota, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, which has, between the three of them, they have less than four million people. So you had 80 million people, or 70 some million people, having the same representation as two million, three million people. So that's represented now. Now the thing about representative democracy sometimes when it gets confused is when you have a, a, a communist party or a socialist party which came over and they're ruling the government, right? And so they set up a people's, a, a people's democratic uh, Congress. And they have more people in there. But the point is, that is an instrument of representative democracy. You can call it socialism, you can call it anything you want to. And it always, always in these places, you have a nation state. This is the form that they choose. And we got to get beyond these nation states. The nation state's history and legacy is clear. Wars, famine, and all kinds of crusades, and all kinds of killing, and murder, and all these big armies. And, and, and it really came to me when I was a child. I, I just, you know, when I was a kid, and when they, I was in the middle of the Cold War, right? And when they just said, we are developing a nuclear weapons arsenal so that we can deter the Soviet aggression. And the Soviets, they developing a nuclear arsenal which can deter American or Western aggression. So these people were prepared to destroy all everything living on the planet just so one or, one or the other of these nation states can, can survive. You know what they call it? Mutually assured destruction. Well, that's what it was. They, 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 it depended on who could destroy the other one first. <laughs> and that, that's, that's a certain amount of insanity. I mean, really, I mean, you, you think about it. You say, in American exceptionalism, now that's even more ridiculous. There's nothing exceptional about American nation state or any state. You know? People are people.
because I'm American, that means that I can do certain things that other people do? No. Like, of course, of course, if you don't understand democracy in the United States, you ain't gonna understand it in the world. You know? <laughs> so I guess I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't expect you to be in the room to discuss that. You know? but, but, but representative democracy is a very, very, very hard thing to critique. Because we, we, learned, we learned it in school. Everybody, uh, we're supposed to vote and do our civic duty. They do what we're told. And, and, and people don't make no laws. There's some people up there who make laws. It should, it should be pretty clear now with the, uh, with the, uh, with, with the big, big corporations and the lobbyists controlling it. It should be pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know that in the, in the entry, um, this sort of came up in the context of a project in the United States called Cooperation Jackson. Um, and I was wondering if, if you knew folks uh, or have had any communication with folks who are involved in that project, because I think on the left, it, also, it often gets held up as an actual community that is that has collective ownership of some of the means of production um, and is using the assembly format. But you also brought up sort of more of the co-optation that has taken place with like the mayor there of Jackson, Mississippi. So yeah, just, I was wondering if you had any um, communication with the folks who are part of Cooper Cooperation Jackson and what you see as a sort of the po positive elements of that model and what are some of the dangers of the co-optation um, I knew Chokwe Lumumba, who was the father of the present man. And uh, he was from Detroit. He was a member of the Republic of Africa. And their position was the America was likely to need to have five states that of their own. He was a, that's a, a real hardcore nationalist position. And uh, he was a lawyer, he was a very, very learned guy. He went down to Jackson and he was around from there for a while. When he was uh, elected mayor. But now you can see what's going on. Of course, he, he, uh, he died relatively young. And his son, and that's another thing. I mean, this is not a royal kind of thing. I mean, you know, him, his son or him or nobody else, you know, direct democracy. Everybody has the same rights. Everybody has the same say. Who your daddy is and how much money you got, hopefully, you realize that. Doesn't matter. Everybody should have a right to say what they want to say. And then you don't have a problem with uh, any kind of patronage because uh, nobody's going to get any advantage over anybody else. Right? But see, direct I mean, in the uh, indirect democracy, our revenue government has that patronage element in it. And that's what puts them over. But the point is, you can see what he's done now. He's, uh, what the new mayor has done, the son of Chomwe, what he has done is uh, gone and, and, and uh, united with the people who want to disarm everybody, the people who uh, look at uh, one control as the end all and be all and some kind of peace. And so what he does is disarm black people and the policemen are the only ones in the arm. And then uh, he defends police brutality, police action, and he presents, and he, uh, he, he, he also defends some uh, injustices in the actual uh, jails and the prisons. The point is, people now seeing that uh, he's making some unilateral decisions, and he's been kind of silent lately because he's being exposed. But uh, they do have an advisory assembly. You know, the, when I say an advisory assembly, like he'll, he'll call some people together that he knows, and they'll call themselves the assembly. And he'll listen to what they got to say, and then he go back and do what he wants to do. So the people don't move. That's a thing. That's not that much. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, and then I see, is it Rafa? Rafa, did you have a question you wanted to ask? I can unmute you here if you want to ask. Mm -hmm. You are unmuted, so you can go ahead and ask your question. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. It's, uh, it's night here, but. Uh, yeah, you look like you're sleeping, man. <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, I'm from Belgium, so it's uh, it's quite late here. Oh, okay. uh, and um, what I wanted to ask, because here in Belgium, maybe also in the rest of Europe, I don't I don't really know, but here, uh, 
more attention is going now to the to the psychological and the social needs of young people like uh, children not only children but all young people you know during this pandemic during this <clears throat> health crisis and i was wondering how that is now uh, in the usa is that also going uh, more attention now to their needs uh, after the first uh, you know after the first uh, big problems you've had there let me ask you this because they're they're talking about reopening the schools in uh, august here schools are closed most of the schools are closed what about in belgium like schools are opening or what, what's going on here i don't know um they're opening more and more um so like the the youngest children they uh, they will be going uh, to school all of them uh, soon uh, for the moment it's still just some years you know like uh, years of uh, of schooling they think of as uh, important so it's also with small classes and uh, with uh, mouth caps uh, teachers using mouth caps and the uh, children having mouth caps but they are also now like uh, we call them, we call them holiday masks. Masks. Yes. Yes. because the uh, mask uh, sorry mask and uh, because the holidays I, are also I like, coming I like mouth, mouth caps. <laughs> okay yeah. and they are also like uh, saying things like uh, that they want um, groups of 50 youngsters to be able to um, to have activities together in their in their own uh, bubbles you know they, they they work a lot with bubbles of uh, of people you have a small bubble of friends you can uh, be in or you have you will have uh, uh, you will have bubbles of 50 young people you can uh, have activities in but they saw that um, the the distancing measures they weren't so good for the young people so uh, a lot of psychologists were complaining things like that so they have they've started to change things like that Yeah, I mean, just uh, I have a 14 year old daughter and uh, just in my experience as a parent going through this whole thing, uh, it's I think that there hasn't really been much attention paid to the uh, uh, for lack, I, I don't I don't know the right vocabulary necessarily, but the, the psychological impact on on children. Uh, it's, you know, kids really need to be among their peers, especially, you know, um, when they get into the preteen and teenage years, it's a, it's a huge part of their identity. Um, and it's I think really difficult for them to navigate um, sometimes like, you know, what the fuck do I do now? And I've had, you know, my kid, she's all right, but but the, I've heard I've had messages from other parents like, "Hey, you know, you know, get get your kid to call my kid because she's really lonely and stuff like that," you know, and this kind of thing. And it, I think informally, like um, amongst ourselves, we're all trying to figure that out um, and navigate that. But uh, it's something that, in terms of advice from any kind of experts or from uh, the state or anything, we it's been it's been not really even talked about um even from the school you know like the school they were just mostly concerned with like i don't even know what the fuck they're concerned they're concerned <laughs> getting these lessons done and getting you know and like like making themselves seem like they matter you know the, the schools and the teachers you know but like the actual you know well-being of the child emotionally they don't really care they just they want the kid to turn in the thing so they can say they taught the kid the thing they're supposed to teach the kid and like that's 
that's pretty much the limit of their of their give a fuck. But um, so yeah, I don't know. It's a really good question, Rafa. I'm glad you I'm glad that you brought it up. Uh, and it's something that you know, to Modibo's point, I think it we end up figuring it out for ourselves first. And then, you know, maybe later on we'll hear from some experts or from the government or for, from whoever, like, oh, you know, this is going on. And so here's some advice on how you can do that. But all of that, whatever policy or advice comes, will be based upon the work that we do informally in our own communities, you know, just as ordinary people trying to get by, you know. Um, yeah. And I think that also that that being said, the uh, there was a good article recently I read, and I don't remember where, but it was kind of talking about the sort of abstinence only approach that has been going on with the social distancing, how it might not be sustainable. Um, and I think that to young people, that might especially be the case um, that they're, you know, that it, rather than forcing them to stay away from their peers, we might be better advised. And I'm, Criticizing myself on this, we might we might be better advised to teach them how to interact socially safely, you know, um, and that's that's something that I think has not always been at the forefront of, of our minds. I know I know the networks of parents that are teaching their children how to interact with their peers and their children. They're teaching each other's children. And, uh, and they're testing, I mean, they're, they're, they're testing each other for the symptoms and everything. They check themselves. So, you know. And that's, that's how I mean, I, I would like to be in, in y'all's presence, you know. I mean, it's good to see you, especially you, Ralph, or you can run over there. Uh, but, you know, I, I really think this is a good format, but sooner or later, we just gonna have to get together and, and, and touch and look at one another. And, Mm -hmm. in one another's presence. Now, on, the, on this bookstore thing, I see some things happening now. Uh, like uh, like the, the independent bookstores are challenged now. And I think that we all need to develop some kind of delivery mechanism or some kind of uh, drive-by, drive-through or something that uh, we can get to inventory. You know, people need to know what books you got and then they can come by and get the books and you can get them at the window or do some things, but uh, yeah, yeah, you know, it's, and it's not really rocket science. It's not, it's just a matter of people figuring out how this thing can be contained among uh, an intimate circle of people and, uh, and take care of yourself. Like, I, I wouldn't feel, uh, I mean, I know, I know Andrew, so I, he can come in my house, but I'm not gonna let some other people in my house. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Until I know you, so maybe maybe that's just uh, that's just it might be a good thing, it might be a bad thing. But, uh, mm. I think the distancing, and understanding the virus, and understanding that this is not going to be the last virus. You know, it's been nineteen. These viruses are jumping species left and right. Now. So, uh, we 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 we're going to have to be as scientific as we can and read what these people are saying. So we'll know how to cap our face and shut our mouth, you know, <laughs> and, and just be, protect ourselves. I mean, it, 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 look at look at this one. You remember when uh, syphilis was going around and gonorrhea was going around? We just put the cap somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a cap, you know what I mean? If you know where the transmission. When I was in South Africa, now let me tell you that it was the AIDS, AIDS thing. And I was under my van, I'm in my truck, trying to fix my truck with a friend of mine. And he cut himself, and he bled all over me. So I, <laughs> I bled all over my arm. So I knew that that's where it was transmitted through the arm, you know, through the, through the blood. So uh, I had to go to the doctor. I didn't, I went to the doctor and got myself checked. The point is, you got to know how this thing works, and what animal, how it's jumping, and what's what the research shows. And uh, the American doctors are behind on this. The Australian doctors and the Chinese doctors are, are way out in front of this. And the, and, the, and the homeopathic medicine people are very much out in front of it. 
and uh, in, in South Africa, they have, have what they call indigenous knowledge system, where they didn't try to destroy, the, well, they didn't try to conquer the people and then just bastardize all of them, their, uh, you know, their, their knowledge. But people learn uh, and, 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 and collect their, their knowledge in such a way that their uh, children and their whole society can access it, whether it's orally, whether it's through law, or whatever, it's, it's collected there. And when colonization took place, an enormous amount of human mm -hmm. knowledge was lost. All over the world, it was lost. And uh, in South Africa, they're trying to you know, inter reintegrate it while these people still live uh, But well, we need to be very alert scientifically and say these natural viruses are and be, and be careful because sometimes the state wants to deceive you. And so we have to be astute to figure that out too. This, this is one of the, let's, this hear is, from, let's hear from a woman. We've got some questions up on the chat, I think, Mick, if you want. Uh, I, think, I think all of those have been asked as I'm scrolling through. Oh, it looks like there's one from Nico that didn't get asked. Nico? You want to ask me? Unmute Nico. Unmute. There you go. There you go, Nico. You're unmuted. I saw that Nico had some food delivery a second ago on the yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of curious what you got to eat. It's a vegan hash. Uh, there you go. Hey, like where cabbage where? and Brussels sprouts. Yeah, it looks really good. Is it good? Yeah, I'm about to dig in soon, but uh, nice. well, I'll ask my question before I stuff my face. Um, like when I read the book, uh, Pan African Social Ecology, and you touched upon this part too, when uh, Martin Luther King Sr. went to the sanitation strike with uh, the mayor in 77, was the, the community in particular, the black community, just flabbergasted at his response? Whereas his, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. had so famously sided with the striking sanitation workers, you know, in the decade before, what, what was the reaction from the community when S Martin Luther King Sr.? Uh, well, Manny Jackson had signed with the workers too. And the workers, when, he, when they got betrayed like that, the workers used to have a sign saying, uh, Maynard's word is garbage. But they were flabbergasted. The he was unapologetic. And, and, and you got you to gotta know Atlanta. Atlanta has a stratum of uh, black people that. Uh, that was some of them were against the civil rights movement, and so uh, you know they were flabbergasted. But, they, the, but, the, but the, uh, the union leaders were part of that segment too. You know, the union leaders, so the workers were just out there by themselves. I never seen a uh, group of workers that disappointed and that isolated enough in our lives. Um, but so symbolic politics does that. You know? mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, it looks like Art, Art B also has a question here. So I'll unmute you, Art. You're good to go. All right. Can everyone hear me? All right. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to like, after reading the book and also listening to that last answer kind of about. Um, Are you from Canada? Are you from Canada, right? I'm from Halifax. Oh. Yeah, I'm from Halifax. I'm telling you, I was guy doing the war, man. You yeah, remember Rocky, um, you remember Rocky Jones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, yeah, I live close to where Lynn Jones lives. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, she lives in the city and stuff. Yeah, no. I, caught, I caught that on boat. <laughs> yeah, everybody <laughs> hears the accent right away. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, I just wanted to, I just wanted to like tease out a bit more because it's an interesting idea, like this distinction between participatory, participatory democracy and direct democracy because they, I think it's used interchangeably a lot, like in, in leftist discourse and stuff. But I, I'm confused a little bit about where the distinction is. So um, if I'm thinking about like social, the social ecology part of like the book um, and the way it, you try to synthesize it with like this internationalist kind of um, pan-Africanism, which I think is really compelling. Um, I'm thinking back, thinking back to Murray Bookchin and like people who sort of coined the term social ecology. Uh, 
this, the suggestion that he makes about how to get there seems to be through participatory democracy. Direct democracy. Direct yeah, democracy. like like through like libertarian municipalism, as he calls it or coins it. So I wonder, like, and with with cooperation Jackson or with even like Rojava, which is like the more famous example right now. I, I was wondering, like, what is the, really the distinction? Because I I could even see people interpreting like classical examples like the CNT and their, their various forms of like delegation kind of representation as participatory and not direct, right? So, yeah, I just wonder where that line is. Yeah, well, that's a hell of a question there, bro. So what I'm gonna do, what I wanna do is, is appear to diverge, but I think you need to understand it because I think you're there. Um, when you talk about colonialism, there's classical colonialism. That's where the uh, imperialist power sends their own administrative apparatus to govern in different regions across the way away from them. That's classical, uh, classical colonialism. Neo-colonialism is um, uh, where the uh, indigenous people, where the indigenous people elect their own representative institutions of democracy, like Kwame Nkrumah and them, and all that. They were, the, they were, they were called the Pan-Africanists. Now, I would call them the classical Pan-Africanists. Because they were they they saw state power, participatory not 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 participatory but uh, that, uh, indirect democracy or uh, uh, you know the representative representative of Republican type democracy. That's who they were. We passed there now. Neo Pan Africanism is a grassroots, uh, direct democratic thing that. That, that I'm trying to popularize. Now, the, the problem we had is the historical problem. Maury Bookchin and uh, C.L.R. James were developing ideas that were meaningful, but they never did cross paths. And some of you, I didn't even see a footnote that any of them used or, of each other's writings and stuff. Yeah. But it's clear, it's clear to me that Pan-Africanism, and, and, uh, and, and, which is direct, the, 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 the neo pan african direct democracy and social ecology, they, they, they have to work together. You can't have social ecology, integration of human society with the rest of the natural world. Because what, what Bookchin brings to the table is he says that, um, uh, that human society is natural. You know, it's not unnatural. And so, if you if you uh, if, if human society is natural, then we have to figure out a way to uh, work with the rest of the natural world as human beings, not as conquerors, not as uh, guardians, not as uh, resource users or exploitators, but as symbiotically. Now, to me, that's where direct democracy come in. But you got to have a human scale of it. You can't have. And I think Bushkin is. Uh, vague on this part, but you got to have, you can't have a, a, a direct democracy in, in New York City and for it to still be New York. Right. Or you can't have direct democracy in the uh, United States of North America for it to be United States. You know, and so people say, well, where does it exist? And that's why this book is so important. It exists in Rojava. It exists around you. you, you sometimes it exists in places that's unrecorded, but we, that's because we can't see it, that don't mean it doesn't exist. <laughs> Neutrons, protons and stuff <laughs> exist. If you too dumb or not skilled enough to see it, or don't have the technology to understand it, that don't mean it don't exist. So the line is drawn where you have direct democracy, that's people deciding directly what they're gonna do. No intervening layer, no mediation at all. You know, just, just them deciding directly what they want to do. And that's hard for people to understand, but, but I mean, people do it all the time, you know, at different scales. So we have to figure it out. What's your last name, Bob? Uh, Bauman. Bauman. It's a, yeah, it's a Dutch name. My dad, my parents are immigrants, so I don't have oh, the okay. Afro, oh, okay. African and Canadian roots. Like, you, you, live in, you, live, you live in Nova Scotia now? Yeah, yeah, I grew up here. 
I grew up here. Oh, okay. Well, man, yeah. Man, I grew up there. We were talking about getting up there before all this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it'd be sweet if you guys could come up here, actually. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. You know, I used to live right off Cottage Street. Yeah, I'm right down, I'm right down from the Citadel. Like, that's... Oh, yeah, I, I went up on the hill. Yeah. yeah. If you read the book, there's a picture of me on the Citadel on the hill. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's yeah. wild. Yeah. <laughs> that's wild. Well, let's have um, some more. What about Ariel? What about Ariel? Some more women. Uh, you want to hear some? You want to ask a follow-up question? I, oh, I wanted um, to just. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, sorry. You first, please, Andrew. Oh no, I was just going to say that maybe in a minute, also related to Art's point, you could talk about state creep, which I think. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Art is, so. art is, art is, That's a hell of a question. I need Yeah. But no, please go ahead, Ariel. I'm sorry. Oh, um, I don't really have a question. I haven't read your book yet. I'm sorry. Um, I'm just uh, here to learn. Um, I'm new to social ecology. I'm new to leftism, actually. Um, uh, I'm just I'm just here to learn. <laughs> I love I love social ecology. Um, I I recently read the ecology of freedom, and my life changed. Oh, yeah. I'm, oh, I'm yeah. like oh, really yeah. into social ecology now. So, no, Bushkin, Bushkin, Bushkin never explained Africa. That was his limitation. You know, he was, he was in the Africa, he was in the leftist movement in the United States in Europe. Yeah, I'm, I'm new to I, I, I uh, grew up with really Republican parents and. Um, all of that. So I, this is a, a big transition for me and um, I'm, I'm loving it. It's awesome. <laughs> where, where are you now? I live in Dayton, Ohio. Oh, okay. You know, that's the, that's the scope of this. You know what I mean? People from all over the country. And leave. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. <laughs> well, wel welcome, Ariel. Thank, thank you. <laughs> sorry, I didn't have a question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'll make sure you read both books. Yes, I will. I will. <laughs> and also, um, there was another comment that somebody posted to Modibo. Um, uh, Ursula posted that uh, she loves the concept of directly democratic music. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, um, when you were talking about jazz, yeah, and jazz as part of the democratic process. Um, I used to play that music. I used to just, I mean, I had a good time too. I mean, everybody expressed themselves and nobody was left out. And then everybody, it starts, the structure of it, it has structure. You start off with a theme, which mm -hmm. sets the contour of it all. And then everybody goes out in this variation, and then you come back with the theme. And then you just play it. That's the way it's needed. Kind of like, yeah. yeah. I know that, that we're running low on time. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm, I, I would really appreciate if it's all right with, with Mick, if, uh, if you wouldn't mind, because related to Art's point and Art's question, this, this line between uh, participatory democracy and direct democracy, I think it gets, it, you, I know you and I have talked about it a lot and, and you're working on some writing on the subject right now, but the, uh, this state creep, right? Like where you can have institutions or, or movements that are seemingly directly democratic, but the, the state, not necessarily a specific state, but the structure of the state can kind of creep in to those movements. It, would you mind elaborating on that for a second or, or maybe explain? You can see it, you can see it, but it has to do with spontaneity. Like, um, state creep is a concept that I developed because I never was convinced with the Leninist concept of I never was convinced with the Leninist concept of living in the way of states. States don't live in the way. States mm -hmm. states are there to maintain themselves and to maintain the, the order. You can't have a proletarian state. I mean where the workers take over and maintain a state. That's that that to me was problematic. I just I, I just couldn't go there with that. So state creep and I've seen it a lot. State creep is a concept that I introduced, which helps you understand, like, when a when spontaneous motion takes place now, there's, uh, there's institutions that are created, the direct democratic institutions that come, like the Paris Commune, for instance, or, or, or whatever else there is. 
And what happens is that if, if the movement is not clearly anti-state, then the state will send in all kinds of representatives that pretend to be a part of the movement, the social workers, or, uh, and, and, you know, the, the agents of the state, but they, they don't have to be police. They can be social workers, they can be teachers, they can even be uh, revered reformers from the past who come in and they set some kind of reform agenda. And if you're not vigilant over time, you know, they end up set, setting up these participatory institutions. The next thing you know, you're advising them, um, uh, they'll bring in the Congressional Black Caucus, you know, or somebody from you know, one of these state organizations to, to, to help you. That's what they say, they'll help you. And then they, what they end up doing is uh, uh, subverting what you're doing. And, and, and over time, it comes in, the next thing you know, it's like the Black Power Movement. After it's all over, everybody running for office. <laughs> like SNCC, <laughs> people from SNCC, they, even Rocky Jones was running for office. <laughs> <laughs> so that's state creep. I mean, that, that's when the, the state, uh, after some conspicuous period of mass upheaval, and new institutions form, then these other the institutions are worn down by existing ideas and existing order. And over time, they move back in the sky. <laughs> but if you're vigilant, and, and, and that's where we got to be, you can see when, when, when it happens. And, and our careers must not be that. Like, you, 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 I mean, it's not, it's not a success story to become a mayor. You know what I mean? A congressman. <laughs> You gotta stay with the people. Mm -hmm. Stay with the people, stay with the music, stay with it. This young lady who sang, she, she's gone now. A couple of times we sang. Oh, there she is. She, she, she has something to say to her. She's been fishing in this one. Un Unmute, unmute. Uh huh, sure. Did you have something you wanted to say? Um, no. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Yeah, no worries. So where are you now? What's that? Sorry. Where, where, where are you? I'm in Atlanta. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know if anybody else is having a problem, but I'm having a hard yeah. time. Can you? Get a little closer to the microphone. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> a little bit, but uh, I hate to do anything, but I might lose you. Lose everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If, if you speak loudly, we can hear you. I think. Okay. I'll speak loud. You got a question? How much more time we got? Then we can do another question. But I think you know the idea is to make sure you read these books, and maybe we can do it again or something. Uh, uh, you can email me at the press or, or modibogadali at yahoo.com. Yeah. Also, please, um, if y'all are on social media, uh, please follow us. We're on Facebook, um, on uh, Instagram as at ua books o o o a three o's and an a books. Um, same thing with Twitter. Um, we're we're on there as well. And Ua, Ua means on our own authority. On our own authority, yeah. Uh -huh. That's a good name. I like cool. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe that's a good spot to to wrap up for tonight. Then I think you know we had said eight and we're yeah, one a little bit older. Apologize, you need to apologize for uh, um, you know you look puppy that sick. Yeah, yeah, my uh, my coworker uh, Liberty, who some of you may know, Andrew referenced earlier, uh, was supposed to be here tonight, and she was really excited to be on the call. Um, she's a long-term member here at the Firestorm Collective, uh, and unfortunately, her uh, her little pup, who is sort of like our storefront dog, Julius, uh, is having some serious health issues. So there was sort of like an emergency surgery tonight that needed to be taken care of. 
Um, so Liberty had to run before we were able to start the event. Uh, but they were really excited to be here uh, and hear from Medibo and Andrew. Um, Let me say something, Mike, before we leave. Sure thing. Go for it. Uh, I enjoyed, I enjoyed um, my, my visit up there last time. And we had a big crowd of diverse people in, in that same bookstore there. And it was mm -hmm. mob. It was mob. I enjoyed it. The feedback and just the camaraderie. It was just a wonderful thing to behold. You want to be a part of it. Great. Thanks, Medivo. Yeah, and like you said earlier, so we are actually uh, shipping books. Um, so Firestorm, uh, you can go to our website, which is just www.firestorm.coop. I also, in the chat feature here, I dropped in a link for both Pan-African Social Ecology, which was Medivo's book that came out last year, um, and Deciding for Ourselves, which is an anthology uh, that explores the promise of direct democracy and um, projects that, contemporary projects that exist in the world right now, um, of which one is Modibo's uh, take on intimate direct democracy. Um, so both those links are in the chat and um, we're shipping all over the country right now uh, for just a dollar, um, just a dollar for shipping. Uh, so if if uh, folks want to learn more about what you heard tonight in this discussion, uh, there's lots of really good information in both of those books, and I'd highly suggest them. Um, and really want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, I think it was nice, even though this is a little strange to have a virtual event. Um, I think we did, we were able to have a little bit of a discussion there. Uh, and I know that's the style that Medibo uh, really encourages and you know I appreciate it as well so it was great to hear from folks tonight and to both Andrew and Madiba thanks so much for coming out and having this discussion and including us in it with you um, yep. thanks so Anything much for else? having us and, and yeah, thank you to everybody yeah all the people who came internationally especially thank you so much Absolutely. Thanks, y'all. Have a good night.